Yeah, why are we why doing, are we doing it? <laughs> why are we doing it? You were going to ask we me, love weren't to... you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking you. We just love to scoot. Welcome to the Swiki Podcast, inspiring positive change through design, innovation and technology. Hello, welcome to the podcast. Sorry it's been so long. Uh, we've been really busy here at Swifty HQ, but um, today's podcast is all about the Swifty Go series and what we've been up to. So pretty excited to do this. Uh, we've not talked to you for a while. Apologies. Uh, but we've got so much to share, haven't we? Yeah, I've got loads. We've been so busy. Mm -hmm. um, and something very nice and shiny is right over there, which we're going to show you in a minute. Yep. Yep, yep. So it's the Swifty Go series. So um, oh, we're over 10 years now into manufacturing scooters um, and we've had some electric, uh, but the electric that we've always had uh, are kind of like our first step into a full electric vehicle. And that was kind of intentional. We weren't quite ready, were we? Um, when the whole kind of electric scooter boom started to happen some years ago. So um, we've always had it in us that we wanted to redesign uh, a vehicle right from the ground up, start fr from a fresh, um, really understand uh, what you guys need, um, how we can physically make it um, and design something that is just really safe and fun to ride. Um, but the main thing we're going to talk about right now is why we're doing it, right? Yeah, why, why we're doing are we it? doing it? <laughs> why are we doing it? You were going to ask we me, loved... weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking you. We just love to scoot. Yeah. We love to scoot and we've already proven that it's such a good um, alternative to walking and cycling but it get, runs alongside those things so um, there's a big uh, reason why we want to walk cycle or scoot um, around and that's to decarbonize all of our journeys um, and these vehicles bikes scooters they're really important to basically be used for the short distance trips and as we know short distance trips make up over two-thirds of all journeys mm. all of our journeys so that's a massive um, chunk of the carbon and polluting journeys yeah, are only short distance that often gets overlooked because all the focus is on the automotive industry yeah. and EVs and actually um, if we were to embrace um, micro-mobility and other forms at the same level, I think we could have a greater impact way sooner because vehicles like what we're doing, like what's out there already, uh, can have an impact now. And you really, I, I say this a lot, so apologies if you've heard me say this before, but um, you really can't cheat science like, <laughs> science and physics says this all the time like <laughs> it's 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 there and no matter how much marketing spin you give the truth remains the same if you've got a huge vehicle that needs a huge battery pack that's a lot of resources that goes into building it a lot of resources that go into maintaining it and at the end of the day i'm sorry to say to burst your bubble but the electric has got to come from somewhere and it generally comes from a large proportion of fossil fuels. Um, yes, there is a proportion of renewables. Yes, there is other incentives that are going on, but um, there is this opinion that we need to focus everything on EVs because that's gonna save the planet. The, the likelihood is it's not. It's great because it drives the industry, it drives innovation, it drives economies, it drives you know, cash going in and out of businesses and the supply chain and making that, bolstering all of that industry, that's great. But it's not this, this uh, silver bullet that, 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 that is often purported. Um, I think there are lots of little silver bullets in micromobility that can have a big impact. And that's why you're seeing such a huge range of vehicles coming onto the market. Um, I think many countries have also admitted that the, the grid isn't ready for everyone to drive an electric car. I mean, that's not even mentioning how they're so expensive and normal people can't afford electric cars. Yeah. So Let, let me just say, though, I'm not against electric cars. 
like we're not we think they're awesome we think they're great and uh and they have their place and and likewise i'm not uh against cars uh traditional combustion engine cars either i think they all have their place i think the uh, a sustainable sensible pragmatic future is where you can own a vehicle that's fit for purpose so if you want to just scoot into town on your electric scooter but you do the 50 mile commute in your ev then that's absolutely fine i don't I, i'm not i'm not opposed to having a range of vehicles and whether that's like you lease it whether you hire it whether you you know share it like i really don't mind i think all of those options are good and i think all those options will cater for different people because we're not all the same we have complex lives you have different needs there are families there are individuals you know there are the, the, all everyone has a different need so mm. um, what we've learned in the last 10 years of um swifty scooters is that scooters are a great option for some people yeah um and many times it's people who have some sort of barrier to walking whether it's just distance or whether they've got some sort of physical know, yeah yeah or mental anything, as well or barriers to cycling and that might be simple as a large hill or mm. um you know back pain or something yeah just there are so many reasons why someone might choose a scooter and it's just a, a really perfect um, solution for them so what we need is choice and in the UK we're still not allowed to ride electric scooters but that hasn't deterred us from developing this one yeah it's just a bit of a shame we can't ride it <laughs> ride it at further the, than the car park at, that's at the at the moment <laughs> here as of October 2023 so if you're watching this video after that date, uh, I hope uh, in 2024 the news is good and they've managed to come to an agreement on what the regulation should be uh, in the UK and have imposed it. Um, we are helping uh, advise uh, departments of the government in terms of what we think as an industrial partner. Um, and the new vehicle that we're going to be showcasing uh, in the middle of October um, of uh, 2023 um, it's supposed to be an example that embodies um, what we think is a scooter fit for purpose on the UK roads. So should we jump into what those specifications are? Yeah, I think everybody's waiting to see it. Yeah, we've been, <laughs> we've been sending out some little, little sneak peeks on Instagram and Facebook and the reaction's been great. So um, first of all, let me just say that the whole idea of the project is we keep coming back to safety, don't we? We talk about so having something that not only has the embodiment of what the usual Swifty values are, and that's, you know, great quality, uh, something that you can fix and repair, um, really good customer service. So we really try really hard to look after you, our customers. Um, but uh, addressing the safety concerns that are out there on the market um, and that what are expressed by non-scooter riders. Um, so the people who get annoyed who are experiencing s scooterists on the pavement, for example, or going too fast, or, uh, you, or the list is endless. Um, so um, I just wanted to say that safety is at the heart of everything that we've done. Um, so we've looked at uh, all of the, the, the huge record of scooter failures so um all the, ma the main thing is at the end of the day if you don't feel safe riding something it's yeah. not fun is it yeah yeah and i think that's the best way to convince the naysayers um is to lead by example and if you've got something which is just undeniable and it's fun to use and it's great yeah. then you're going to go oh okay i can change my opinion and it's absolutely fine to change your opinion and i think with this vehicle we can change people's opinion and so that was the 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 gauntlet that we we laid down when we were trying to to design this thing and it was quite a quite an undertaking but i think we've really hit something really sweet so um yep it's going to have a long lifespan it's made in the uk which is great our battery is going to be made in the uk um it just not necessarily anything to do with hey we have to make everything in the uk but it just means that we're able to 
adopt the design, manufacture the design in a way easier way. Post COVID, like that global supply chain has completely completely changed. Um, so we're, we're really happy that we've we've been able to source a, a bunch of suppliers that are local to us, which just means we can be more reactive, we can get better quality, um, and we can supply you guys faster as well. Um, so let's start with um, the main one. The big one is always um, uh, batteries catching fire, right? So um, we've all seen the videos, we've all seen the news. Um, it's been big news in the UK how some people have uh, sadly lost their lives and people have lost their homes and their livelihoods because they're cheap and terrible. I mean, there's a fair bit of fear mongering going on around e-bikes and e-scooters at the moment. And I yeah, think sure. there's a lot of people are a bit um, cautious and scared of them. Well, I'm scared. I'm scared for consumers because I know what's available on the market and I know how there are, you know, companies, and individuals who are importing substandard stuff, mm. which doesn't cut the mustard. I mean, so what you know, happens when something catches fire? What's a normal scenario? Well, generally speaking, nine times out of ten, I would argue it's the um, mischarging um, um, of the battery pack. So when you have the wrong charger or an inadequate charger... Um, or you buy a replacement from... Um, you know, a non-branded charger, basically. Yeah, yeah. So in the in the battery itself, a battery is made up of a bunch of cells, right? Those cells are connected together um, in all sorts of different configurations and voltages and output, currents, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, depending on the requirement. But that battery has something inside, which is like a mini little computer called the the BMS or the Battery Management um, um, System, and that's a little uh, circuit board uh, with with a chip on there. And basically that regulates the uh, and helps the charging of those cells and it helps to maintain and basically keep them in good health. Um, it will shut off, it should shut off uh, the charging if something unbalanced is going on. Um, because what you want is all those cells to be um, have the same kind of nominal voltage and charge across them and you want to charge them all equally. And if there is some imbalance then the, the battery management system goes towards trying to trying to smooth that out and make sure that it's it's charging correctly as per the manufacturer's specifications. So what happens is when you have uh, battery packs that maybe have the wrong BMS on there, which can happen, or they mismatch the charger and it's the wrong charger that tries to charge the system. Maybe it's a 24 volt charger and it's a 36 volt battery, for example, um, or, or it's mismatched in some way, um, then you can have uh, you can have problems occur. So what happens is heat builds up. Uh, inside the cell itself, um, it's basically flammable material, the electrolyte's flammable, um, and what can happen is the battery can get hot, it starts to break down, and that's when you get what's called thermal runaway, and it's basically an event that can't be stopped, it's very fast, um, and the whole thing catches fire. And it's what happens if you have it charging, and then it overcharges yeah if you have a yeah you can overcharge the cells so the uh the 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 science uh, is that um once the battery is full and it's not accepting any more charge then there's a there's a there's you know there's charge coming in and it's got to go somewhere and it can result in heat so so with the correct charger that would normally stop it yeah coming overcharged and also the right battery management system as well yeah. the bms so those two are very important to get right and um what we hear and what we see is that um, you know there are systems out there that just have the, the wrong componentry or there's been a mismatch in production so you know the rule of thumb is if it's cheap it's cheap for a reason you know it, it, or it should be um so only buy you know from a quality reputable brand um that has a good after aftermarket care system um, in place, got good reviews, um, and, and, and you, sh you should be good. That goes for everything, you know, e-bikes, scooters, you know, wh whatever the vehicle is. Um, so that is like the number one topic we think, or one of the number one topics that we've tried to address. And what we're really excited about is that we're working with a really cool company called PMBL down in the south of the UK. Um, they have been manufacturing batteries for all sorts of industries for many years. They are our manufacturer of our battery. And we have 
We believe we are the first in the scooter industry and or e-bike industry to use a different battery chemistry. That battery chemistry is called lithium ferrophosphate. Um, that battery technology or chemistry is traditionally used in uh, the storage of energy, so energy packs, um, and also the marine environment. Um, the great thing about lithium ferrophosphate, there's lots of things that is, there's lots of pros, there's a couple of cons, uh, which we don't think are too bad. Uh, the first being is that it has a really safe chemistry. So it's very, very, very hard to uh, get this battery, to abuse this battery to an extent where you can get it to do what the other batteries do, the NMC batteries, and that's catch fire. So it's a very, very stable chemistry. Um, it... so can you just go back over those chemistries? So the normal lithium batteries that you get in the yeah, so scooters are is what NM, NM, NMC. So it's batteries. a lithium based yeah. chemistry. Yeah. So there's lots of the, the 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 term lithium battery is a blanket term which is used for lots of permutations of chemistries, and we can put on the screen all the different ones and show you now um, what those typical applications are for. But they're all variations of the same thing. So lithium ferrophosphate, uh, the first thing is it doesn't have any cobalt in there, which is great because that's uh, we all know and have heard about the stories of how cobalt is mined um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a precious resource. Um, lithium ferrophosphate uses ready av readily available uh, minerals and materials and salts. So it's, um, it's quite good from an environmental point of view, but the, the main point is that it, it cannot catch fire. It's very, 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 very difficult for that cell to have any sort of thermal runaway. So that's why they're used um, in the marine environment and that's why they're used in battery storage because you have huge packs of these things which you know store huge amounts of energy. Um, the big downside to an LFP battery um, and perhaps is why most of the industry don't use it to date is that the density, um, so the physical size of the battery compared to an NMC battery, um, it's almost double the size. So you need double the physical space to put the same rating of battery. So if you've got a 10 amp power NMC battery and a 10 amp power um, um, uh, lithium ferrophosphate battery, um, it's, it's nearly double the physical space to put that in. It's still quite a lightweight uh, battery, so it's not like necessarily double the weight, um, um, but you need a much larger physical space to put it. Another good advantage of lithium ferrophosphate is it has, a, has up to two and a half thousand charge cycles uh, compared to an NMC battery, which is about between three and 500. So this thing will last a long, long time. And um, the output of, of, of current is really consistent. The voltage stays really consistent throughout the duration of one charge cycle. So with other batteries, some of the issues is when you get to like halfway charge, you see a drop in performance. With, it, with our battery, this new battery, there's no drop in performance. The performance mm -hmm. is consistent for probably about, I would say, high 80% of that entire charge of the battery. Yeah, and what it means for the consumer is that the battery will last longer. Last longer, it means yeah. for the whole industry, there's just less consumption because you're not having to produce replacement batteries. Yeah, because you're going to have it for a number of years, Yeah, for sure. I mean, who could... You, you can't do, I mean, 2000 charge cycles, like that's years, it's like four years of use. Like you're not gonna completely discharge an entire battery 365 days a year, are yeah. you? I mean, I mean, maybe there maybe, are. Maybe it's the last 10 years. I think 10 years might be pushing it, but <laughs> I mean, theoretically, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and the, the, the other great thing is they're, um, they're, they're, they're much, they're much, um, What's the right word? Uh, they're, they're way easier to kind of like handle and maintain. Like they're really robust uh, from a charging cycle point of view. Um, so, for example, you can um, you, you can fully charge it and you can use it, and it will drop down to let's say sixty percent. And you could like plug it in and charge it for another ten percent, take it out, and then you know you could then let that run down and then charge it again for another half an hour and it'll go up and that's kind of like that's like a no-no you normally you kind of like let it drain all the way down and you give it a full charge right that's why 
you know, throughout the day, everyone lets their phone charge down and then they charge it overnight back up to 100%. With, with lithium ferrophosphate, you, you can really abuse it like, like, like no other cell. You can just charge it for like 20 minutes, an hour, get it back up, go and do what you're gonna do, come back and then charge it again. And it, it's really, it won't disrupt the, the chemistry. It's like, it's really stable, uh, continues to output, uh, continuous charge, uh, current, sorry, um, and, and give you the performance that you need. So that there's so many pros to this chemistry, uh, far it outweighs the cons. Yeah, we're gonna have to write write a blog about it because there's way more that we haven't included yeah i'll, I'll, I'll yeah <laughs> we'll, we'll put together a really in-depth um pros and cons list and we'll explain everything for the people that want to dive into the the battery in in, in greater detail um, so with the battery we're going to have two options um, there's going to be a single battery or a double battery option for the vehicle um, each battery will give you about 20 kilometers of range um, so if you go for the double battery option obviously that would be more expensive uh, but you would get 40 kilometers of range um, the good news is that you can um, you can if you use a fast charger uh, you, which we will give the option for uh, you can charge up to 80% of the, the battery in about one hour. So we think that that's pretty, pretty good. So even if you went for the single battery option, and this is just so that we can uh, give you the consumer as low an entry price as possible to the vehicle, because uh, the batteries are a really expensive part of the vehicle. Um, so if you go for the single pack and you've got the supercharger, like, I mean, you can plug it in for an hour and you're already back up to, to 80%. So you can do another, an, you know, another another 15 kilometers or something. So, you know, a journey that's 35 kilometers. I mean, who does 35 kilometers really, unless you're, you know, d a delivery service or you're, you know, you, you, you do live really far from work. But I, th I think most people that will cater for and, and they'll do a good job, right? Yep. So the next bit I want to talk about is the handling and dealing with uh, the lumps and bumps on the road, uh, debris, uh, going over potholes, all that kind of so stuff. We're talking about rider safety here. Yes, yeah, so rider safety. So, so there's some evidence that uh, scooters with small wheels and fast speeds or something um, can basically do the front trip accident where they hit something with the yeah. front wheel. Let's put a link to our video. Just we'll put okay. it here in the middle, middle, how this <laughs> works. So some scooter designs are kind of shorter wheelbase and small wheels. And if they do go fast, and if you hit something while going fast, it's quite a common accident to do this front tripping. And so that's something we definitely want to address with our form factor. Yeah. So we've, we've opted for full suspension. So the vehicle has rear and front suspension, which is adjustable. Uh, you have a traditional suspension fork on the front, uh, which has yeah. a preload setting. And how much difference do you think this makes for a ride? It's game changer. I mean, Absolute we've, game changer. I mean, we've never had suspension before. Um, we've always had the belief that, oh, you don't really need it. You know, you can, you can have high pressure tires so you can reduce the pressure of the tires to like 40 or 60 psi and you get like that natural kind of cushioning from the tire um you know it's a much bigger heavier vehicle and the suspension changes everything it really changes everything it's been an absolute dream to ride like we've been developing this for gosh Eight, eight months now and we've got two vehicles uh, in the warehouse that we've been tinkering around with modifying changing stuff every time you go out and you ride it it's such a pleasure to ride isn't it I mean we're quite lucky outside in the forecourt here it's nice big open tarmac uh, space but you know recently we've just been doing some range um, uh, tests where we've been going out on trails and seeing how far it will go and through even like the muddiest conditions on a trail up and down it just performs so well it sucks up all of the all of the bumps and the lumps so it's like riding a brand new vehicle and what's really weird is so comfy isn't it yeah i mean you you like it you've been riding it what's what's your thoughts well just mainly that it's comfy it's that cruising feel isn't yeah. it yeah 
Yeah. It's like you're... It's very relaxing. I yeah, that's find. a good word. Yeah, it's really relaxing. Yeah, you're right. It's really relaxing. <laughs> it's like, it's because you feel like you're floating though. Yeah. I mean, we've all, I mean, I think one of the things that have always been really nice, I mean, you said this not long ago, the, the really nice thing about riding a scooter is that you're, you are like hovering above the floor, stood up, going really fast. And that's, that, it's a really nice feeling, right? Yeah. And then when you add, <clears throat> when you add suspension, it's enhancing that. Yeah, definitely. And just really fun. Very fun, very relaxing. Yeah. And uh, there's nothing like that feeling, I think, apart from maybe skiing. It's quite similar to skiing. Yeah. In nice, if you're fresh, good at skiing. In nice fresh powder. <laughs> yeah, it's a flo very floaty <laughs> feeling. So we've um, the the geometry is different on this vehicle as well, and that's that helps with the suspension as well. So when you're riding it, or when you see some of the video, you'll see how they both independently move, and you can actually adjust the preload of the front and the back. And what I mean by the preload is when they both start to activate. So you can be riding along, and if you've got the preload on a high setting, it means that it, the suspension won't activate until a certain load. Uh, is is uh, is registered. So if you've got this, the setting really low, it'll just be dead springy and it'll work really like at all, all pressures. But when the preload is set to high, it kind of restricts it so that when you do have a high impact, then it comes into action. And that's important because you want to tune the suspension to your, your weight, so how heavy you are. Um, and also if you have the preload set, um, it means you're not going to lose lots of energy of the suspension moving unnecessarily um, based on where your center of gravity is when you're riding and kind of like the lean angle, uh, etc. Uh, you want it to work when you, when you uh, uh, encounter a, a, an obstacle, so a pothole or a, a small curb or something like that. Should we talk a little bit about um, the uh the pannier racks i think that's Ooh. another good one yeah this is an area you love you, you, you i love the pannier about? racks <laughs> what <laughs> just the love in your voice i can hear it <laughs> go on well it makes sense doesn't it to have space for cargo um because the whole point is to reduce the car journeys and you're just not going to be able to do your shopping mm -hmm. Um, unless you've got a very large backpack. Yeah, so I mean, I think so it's the one thing, that's, one thing that's missing from the scooter industry is a way to carry stuff. Yeah, and or um, even get to work, you want to put your laptop bag on there. Yeah. Um, without a doubt. Yeah. And it's way comfier than have, wearing it on your back. Correct, yeah. So we're going to have a front pannier, a rear pannier, and we're going to have lots of variations and options for you to upgrade or modify your pannier setup depending on what you want to mm. carry. So the rear pannier rack has a, two rails, so you can get two standard 15 litre or maybe 20 litre roll top pannier bags on the rails and you still have the platform on top so you could put something on top as well. On the front one, uh, the ones in the images are just the first one. We have this little platform, which uh, the front pannier bolts onto. So that platform, you can put anything onto. That's gonna be rated up to about 15 kilos of weight, which we think is more than enough uh, for, for, for what most people need to carry. Um, you can definitely get a really good, good supermarket shop on the vehicle. So I reckon like, maybe four bags of shopping, like carrier bags of shopping, you would be able to get on the vehicle. Do you think four bags? Yeah, I think you could get one in each of the pannier bags. <laughs> so there's like 30 liters. You definitely wow. get like 30 liters on the front easily. Well, that's a weekly shop for a family. Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe. <laughs> We're gonna do some cool uh, uh, adapters for the pannier racks as well. So if you wanna take your balance, Swifty balance board and your roller, uh, go to the park and roll in the park, then cool, you can do it and you can put it on the back of the pannier, right? That would be nice. That's gonna be really nice. I don't think we can quite fit a surfboard, but maybe there's a Swifty trailer mm. coming in the future. <laughs> you heard it here first. In fact, have there been any scooters with trailers? Um, I mean, we did that special edition Penguin Books one once where yeah, the trailer was an actual uh, bookshop. <laughs> but, it, 
<laughs> but we'll put an image it up here. It was an actual bookshop. It wasn't designed by us. We made it for, we helped uh, deliver the scooter and the connection for the bookshop uh, for the artist that did it. So it wasn't us that did it, but uh, we just supplied the, the vehicle. Was that in Australia? That was, yeah, for a, a lady that did... Um, really cool installations for like a mo mobile bookshop for yeah penguin. for penguin books yeah um <clears throat> so yes we are looking at uh possibly a trailer we are looking at how to solar charge your batteries as well we've not quite figured that out yet what the system will be but watch this space we'll update you it would be amazing if you could charge your battery off grid um, we are serious about that. We are engaging with customers, uh, uh, companies, sorry, in terms of how to do it. Um, yeah, I mean, how great would that be? You could just go on a long distance journey, holiday, yeah. and be off grid and have transport. Yeah, yeah. It, the, 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 there is some real technical issues in terms of, um, so the ideal situation would be to directly charge uh, your battery from a solar panel. <clears throat> but <coughs> there are many uh, technical issues with that, and you could actually damage your damage your battery very easily if you just if if the weather conditions change, for example. Um, uh, so anyway. so we'll, we'll discuss that in, in another podcast <laughs> if we are successful. But we're trying. Um, so yeah, lots of options for the Panierax, uh, which is cool, and it is foldable, isn't it? Half folding, yep. So the folding stem comes down. Um, so it would be easier to fit into a trunk of a car. Yeah. If you have got a, quite a big boot, you'd need quite a big boot. Yeah, and you can. It doesn't um, fold like Swifty One, does it? No, it doesn't. No. So it's got a rigid fixed frame, uh, but it's half folding, as Camilla just said. The front wheel will come off. It's got a quick release uh, front wheel, so you can, you know, you can save a good. 25 uh, centimeters in length by taking the wheel off um, and I think I think that would be more than enough for most people's needs I've actually uh, transported the vehicle around myself and it fits right across the back the back seats of, of, of the car yeah. so it, it will go in it will fit maybe a little bit of a squeeze for some small cars but it, it will go in uh, so so pretty happy about that um, so let's just go through some of the, the specifications. So we've got front and back disc brakes. Um, some of you I know will complain and moan about that. They're not hydraulic disc brakes, but let me just tell you why. <laughs> hydraulic disc brakes are great. Uh, they're super expensive, let me tell you that firstly. However, they are a nightmare to service, maintain, to install in the production line. Um, we have a very, very long cable run from the, uh, fr from the handlebar to the rear brake. Uh, for you as the customer, it's very difficult to adjust and maintain. You have to bleed the system, get the air out. You're probably going to have to go to a bike shop to service it. Uh, cable disc brakes have got a little bit of a bad reputation from the past when they very first came out because they were really not very good. But I'm telling you, the new cable disc brakes are really good. They perform really well. And the one thing that I really like about cable disc brakes, not just that you can maintain them really easily, um, but they don't give sudden, really terrifying, immediate stopping action. They are a little bit like a traditional uh, uh, um, caliper. caliper pad on a rim, where as you apply more pressure, you can then get more braking force. The amount of people that have told me that they don't like hydraulic disc brakes because they're, they're just so so powerful, so quick. Too sharp. Yeah, and often if you know, you've know you got a friend who wants to go on and try your scooter and they're not used to the braking. It's like when you get, an, you know, when you get a new car and you're not used to the brakes yet. And you're like, Ur. that's what happens when people use hydraulics is they, they're not used to it and then boom and they, they can come off. So coming back to the safety, um, we believe that the, the cable disc brake is a way better option. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't fit a hydraulic disc brake if you wanted to, you could upgrade it yourself. Um, there are expansion kits out there that you can get. Uh, the, the fitting of actually how it is mounted onto the frame is exactly the same. And who knows, I mean, if there is a demand, maybe we can opt offer that as an option in the future. Um, so really good set of brakes. 
Uh, about the speed, we haven't spoken about the speed. Uh, let's talk about all the components you first, and then because that's a big <laughs> that's a big topic, right? So yeah. I'm just I, if I'm looking that way on camera, it's because it's there, and I'm looking at it, <laughs> and deciding what to talk about. Let's just talk about kind of like everything that's on the handlebars uh, and all the lighting and everything. So we've got a nice big powerful front light, we've got a rear light, we've got a brake light, uh, we've got proper indicators that uh, tick when you turn them on and off. And they're on the front and back front and back and um, you can actuate the indicators at the same times so that works as like a hazard light so if you're stop you're stopping somewhere or you're or you're broken down you can uh, which <laughs> won't happen um, you can turn on like hazard lights um, little detail but very much kind of like an automotive kind of vehicle mindset and um, you've got a horn as well um, the throttle has a key so you can uh, not only physically lock your vehicle but you can also lock it with the key so the system just won't turn on without that key. Um, those keys have, will have a serial number so you'll be able to get a replacement cut if you need to. We'll always have master sets so you just have to prove uh, that you're the owner of the vehicle um, through our um, warranty form etc and we can organize a key for you. Uh, for those Swifty customers that are familiar with our folding stem um, we have an auto twisting folding stem. The auto twisting folding stem is now gone and we've gone for a physical stem which has that function in it. So um, it's from a, a really cool German company. Um, the engineering is fabulous and it's they, they've done a very good job so we've opted for that component um, in the folding stem assembly um, which is slightly different if you ha are a Swifty One owner um, of PASS so it'll look the same but it, it operates differently. Um, the, cable, uh, the cables to the vehicle are all exposed on the outside. I know everybody always wants to have fully integrated cables uh, but one thing that we wanted to address was if you need to fix, repair or maintain your vehicle we want you guys to be able to do that because uh, we have customers all around the world um, and we don't want you to pay you know, silly amounts of money to a repair center to take your vehicle to who they'll get in touch with us and they'll do the work and charge you like an hourly rate. So everything is pretty much plug and play. You'll be able to disconnect the screen, for example, or the throttle and replace it with a new one. So we've really thought very hard um, and, and thought about all the issues we've had in the past with servicing and maintaining other customers' vehicles um, just to keep you going and keep you on the road um, as fast and as quickly as possible. And I just wanted to add that that's one of the bugbears people have of the scooter industry, isn't it? That they don't know how to fix and repair them. Oh, yeah, um, good point. Yep. And a lot of e-scooters become then like a throwaway thing. Like, oh, it's yeah. broken. There's no way to fix it. I can't get spare parts. I can't even change my own tyre. Just chuck it. Yeah. So, you know, it's really important to have this Swifty in the industry because it's designed to be able to fix and repair it. Yeah. And just, it just reduces consumption, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I think our, the longest serving time that we know a vehicle has been in operation is over 10 years, um, which is remarkable that we've had a vehicle that's been in operation for 10 years. Like some cars don't last that long. And that's like w one of the very first editions of our folding scooter. And um, oh Yeah, well, it's more than one 10 years old. There's several hundred still yeah. being ridden. Yeah. Yeah, so it's the same with this vehicle, you know, we want it to be in operation for a long time. We want you to be able to fix and repair something, yeah. given the event, you know, you have an accident or someone damages it or something. And I think all scooters should be designed like that. I mean, most bikes are. That's one thing we like about the bike industry, isn't it? Yeah. Is that yeah. they use standard sizes for things so mm -hmm. that you can custom modify them, you can upgrade them, you can replace them. Yeah. And all the bike shops yeah. in the world Stock know those, parts. those sizes. Yeah, those sizes. They sorry, know the tires, they know yeah. you know, the valves of the inner tubes that they all stand they're all standardized. Yeah. And you know, 
the scooter industry should be the same. Well, the problem with the scooter industry is that you've got some large scooter companies who have huge amounts of investments. They have lots of capital and they just have this idea of they want to own the entire market, a little bit like, you know, like Uber or something. And so they make something which is, yeah, which is disposable, which is throw away because they don't want you to fix it. They want you to buy a new one. Mm. And um, that's just the wrong mindset. It's not going to help anything. So we've gone completely the opposite way. Um, if you want to change your handlebars, you want to change your stem, you can do that. No problem. Um, you know, it's fine. All the sizes are common sizes that work in the bike industry, as Camilla have said. So um, that's all the handlebars. And also, we found some really cool tyres. We did find some really cool tyres. <laughs> Uh, let's not, are we going to disclose that now? You want to disclose that now? No. No, let's not disclose it now. <laughs> They're going to be some special editions. So we've yeah. got some really cool tyres for that. So we'll, we'll keep that coming. One thing I want to talk about, which I know will make everybody very ha happy, is it comes with a, a, an integrated kickstand that comes as standard on the vehicle. Um, for other Swifty owners, uh, who have the current kickstand which is over the rear wheel. Um, I know it's not a perfect solution but it's it's a solution which we believe uh, keeps the scooter upright and, and works. So this vehicle has got an integrated kickstand as standard uh, underneath the rear fork and it works really well. It's got a nice little spring, uh, holds it up there and uh, functions really well. So that's really cool. Um, <laughs> before we go into what you wanted to talk about, what did I want to talk about? Uh, did you want to, you wanted to talk about speed and limitation? Cause that's a big to speed. To to topic. Well, I think <laughs> most people ask, they ask two questions. How fast does it go? What's the range? Yeah. Well, let me just finish off on some <laughs> little details. Um, and then we can jump into that as the last topic to discuss. So, um, what I wanted to say was the, uh, foot plate that we, um, <clears throat> have designed for the vehicle is made here right in these four walls of Swifty HQ um, and we have the ability to digitally print onto uh, that surface so we're anticipating a high degree of customization so you can choose the pannier racks you want you can choose a bunch of really nice colors that Camilla's going to select um, we can also do custom foot plate you could also have if you wanted to, you could have a wider foot plate. I wouldn't recommend it, but you could have that. You could have it printed with your corporate logo or a message on there or a really cool graphic, and we can custom make that um, for you here. So um, it's a really nice little thing. I'm really into the customization and making something a limited series or a special edition mm -hmm. or something like that. We've got lots of really fancy finishes that we would like to pursue. Um, yeah. This kind of like fire chrome red sample that we've got is so stunning. It's beautiful. Um, and basically, we we just really enjoy doing that, don't we? Yeah. There's no real reason <laughs> to be able to customise in so many ways, but no, there is. Come on, these guys love it. People love we custom. Love it. People okay. love custom, custom stuff. <laughs> People love custom stuff. My I voice went yeah. really high pitched. I love custom stuff. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> oh dear so, but people have different um you know personalities personalities extrovert introvert sure, why not yeah so the be why not is the basically the answer whole bunch of uh bunch of uses also and go on. why not express a bit of creativity and personality yeah. through your scooter yeah for <laughs> range let's talk about well what about speed Range and speed. Sorry, yes, yeah, speed, 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 speed. <laughs> okay. You, you've already touched on the range and you've already said about okay. the double battery. Okay, so for the UK, we anticipate the law being the, the speed is limited to 25 kilometers per hour. And um, we uh, the vehicle is limited to 25 kilometers per hour. Which is 15.5 miles per hour. Yeah which is the same as the e-bike standard. So I'm pretty confident to say most of the regs are going to align with e-bikes. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, the e-bike standard is yeah. something we can just go on. 
apart from one thing. In the UK, e-bikes have to be 250 watt motor and scooters, I think they're going to be 500 watt. Yeah. So our motor is a 500 watt motor. It's a geared motor. It's not a brushless motor, which means that you have more torque for going up hills. Um, the other question we get asked quite a lot is, can you still scoot it, kick scoot it? <clears throat> the answer is yes, technically you could, uh, and you can, and I have, but uh, you wouldn't want to do that for a sustained amount of time because the foot plate is quite a bit higher and the ground clearance underneath is quite a bit higher uh, than our normal vehicles because we have the suspension. And it's heavier. And it's heavier, yes. I think we said before, uh, currently it's about 25 kilos, but the target is to, obviously, if we can get it lighter, then we would love to do that. Um, and the kick scooters are around eight, eight kilos, so it is significantly he heavier. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But it's a, you know, it's a vehicle that's designed to be ridden it's this, uh, and not kicked. Um, yeah. So uh, it's a complete different. And complete you understand different. that as soon as you, you go on it, don't you? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the, I think the weight is... So will, uh, will anyone be able to ride it faster than 15.5 miles an hour? We, we can change the settings uh, to be faster. The model that I've got has done about 32 kilometers per hour, which is, I'm not going to lie, it's great. It's great. I think I think that speed is mm. is really good for the road. I think sometimes the 25 feels a bit too slow for the road. Um, and also, just to point out, in re in reality, when you're scooting down a hill, that's not limited, is it? Because you don't need... No, you would go as fast as You wouldn't need the throttle on you. when you're going down a hill. You just free wheel. Yeah, and gravity would be your limit, like how fast is it going to permit you to go? So I've gone pretty fast, like going downhill on it. And you do have disc brakes now, which is... Yeah, have the disc brakes now, so... Better for doing fast downhill sections. For sure, yeah, <laughs> so for sure. So just on the motor and on speed, so we will have the option to have an 800 and a 1000 watt motor in the future. Um, it won't be out in the first year of production, so maybe 2025 or something like that. Um, but that motor will just have a, a lot more available power to go up hills. So going up hills is, is definitely something that I'm conscious about. Um, the, the current sample like that we've got here that we've been testing is fine. I mean, it, it will slow down going up a hill. It's not just going to continuously accelerate. Um, and there are some hills that are too steep to go up, so you have to just step off. Um, there is also some uh, protection in the controller, so you can't overheat the controller by just trying to ram more power through. It'd be a little bit like trying to use a power drill and just holding the end really still, and then the motor will just get all warm and hot and nasty and it'll, it'll just degrade the motor. So there are some overcurrent protections in there um, to stop and limit that. Um, but I think the setup that we have is it's, it, it is more than good enough for most people's needs. Um, We've got some pretty steep hills around here, so yeah. we will be testing it. We have been testing. They go, <laughs> they go, they go up some pretty yeah. We'll go yes. up, you know. I think the majority of urban terrain and some suburban terrain is fine. I mean, it's it's it performs everywhere we've ridden it. It's fine. Um, I have been on. I have tried other vehicles which are got way bigger motors, like you know, thousand watt and two one thousand watt motors. To be honest, like really, like the the difference in performance, given that you're like you know you're doubling, tripling, quadrupling the amount of watts that's available in the motor, the the performance increase. It's not that much. It really isn't that much. It's not like four times the performance. It's like the curve like flattens out. It really does. Mm. Cause at the end of the day, you know, you've got, you'd need a, when you've got bigger motors, you need a much larger battery pack. You've got a way heavier vehicle. So there's like, you know, it, it does start to tail off at some point, um, unless, you know, you've got some crazy six kilowatt motor and it's a gearbox chain drive system. So you've got a mechanical advantage to, to make, really give you loads of torque and loads of power. Um, mm. It's a hub motor and it's a battery pack and it's got a controller and I think we're in a like a pragmatic space of this is good quality componentry, it all goes together and works well, uh, it's going to last a long time 
Um, it's not, you know, crazy, crazy expensive componentry to buy um, and it will last a long time for you. So, so what is the price going to be? So the entry price is 2499 Pounds. Um, pounds, that is. Um, and uh, there's going to be an option for a second battery pack uh, and also the whole pannier system and uh, a bunch of uh, accessories that you want. So um, it's up to you to build your own what you want, but the entry price is 2499 yeah. It's just packed full of so many features. Yeah, I mean, just the suspension alone, like, it's cool, yeah, you know. double suspension is amazing, and really the bigger cool. wheels. Yeah. It's just, there's loads of value in it, I think. I'm really, really pleased with it. I'm really excited yeah. to be launching it. Yeah, so on the launch, we are uh, we are packing the sample scooters up, um, and we are shipping them over to America. We're going to be launching the scooter uh, to the public for the very first per time in, 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 in physical reality as opposed to like just online um, on the 19th and 20th of October uh, 2023 at Micromobility America so shout, shout out to those guys um, really cool conference loads of cool companies there in the micromobility space uh, we're going to be there for two days and there's going to be a test vehicle that you can come and try and ride yeah so actually it, that's what i'm really looking forward to is seeing it next to the other vehicles there because even though ours looks bigger because it's got the bigger wheels and mm. but is it actually bigger than our competitors i'm not sure whether it looks much bigger Bigger doesn't always mean better, though, does it? It's about exactly. the performance of when you're on it. But from, from a photo, you think, whoa, well, that's a big scooter. Oh, compared to our but normal Compared ones. to... Yeah. What's no, happening? compared to the competition. Right. I okay. want to see it next to other form factors and other types and things so yeah. people can just judge the size of it. I'm really looking forward to doing that. Yeah, I think it and stands up. riding off. some other scooters and other yep. things. I know there's going to be lots of little micro cars and buggies and little moped things. <laughs> We're going to be riding all of them. Yeah, so if you are in that area or if you can travel there, amazing. I appreciate it's America and not everyone can. And we're a British company yeah. and most people watching this video are from the UK. Uh, but the US is a big market for us. It's a very important market. We've been exporting to you guys in America for many years now. Uh, we intend to do more of that. Yeah, um, so if you're in San Francisco on the 20th of October, in the afternoon, that's, that's a group the, ride. Then the 20th is the consumer day, so consumers can yeah. come to that one. So anyone can come to that. Yeah. Um, I think there's a $10 ticket to join the, the group ride mm -hmm. in the afternoon. Okay. So cool. it'll be really fun. There's loads of vehicles to try out. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Great. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, we are going to be offering uh, ways to join the waiting list uh, for the vehicle. Let's just talk about that. So um, we are expecting the first uh, 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 bunch of uh, scooters to be ready for April in 2024. Uh, so it's just before the UK springtime. Um, yeah, so it's six months away still. Yeah. And we are going to be offering the ability to go on to a waiting list so you're, you can express your interest in terms of joining that waiting list. Um, and we're going to do a bunch of kind of like offers and incentives uh, to, to, to help. Yeah. So uh, if you want to know how to be the first to find out about that, yeah. if you click on the link in YouTube, it's uh, Swifty Go, the Swifty Go series, that link, you can put your email and subscribe to that newsletter yep. and you'll receive the newsletter which announces the pre-order pre waiting list. Yeah, the waiting list, yeah. Uh, so yeah, please um, like, subscribe, uh, give us some comments below. Yeah. Uh, if there's anything we've missed and you want us to talk about, then we can, we can do that. So uh, as always, thank you for your support. Uh, thanks for all the messages yeah. and uh, we hope you like it yeah i hope you like <laughs> it so yeah please give us a thumbs up yeah okay and if there are any swifty fans in san francisco we'd love you to see to come yeah 
to the event on the 20th of October, that'll be amazing. If you've got any advice of what to do in San Francisco, because we're going to stay yeah. for a week afterwards, uh, let us know. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you and see you there. Yeah, thanks guys. Bye. Thank you, bye.